All right, everybody, welcome back to uh, Coffee Talk. Today's topic is uh, Menuchat Nefesh, also known as tranquility. Okay, so um, we've been spending time speaking about uh, different quality traits that help us achieve a level of, uh, I guess, balance within our souls. We've spoken a lot about the idea that our character traits are uh, unique in the sense that um, some of us are gifted with amazing traits. Some of us are gifted with such not such amazing traits. But our 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 job as human beings, as spiritual beings, is to recognize our weaknesses and strengths, and always figure out a way of how we can become bigger, better, greater. So this first source over here of Simcha Zizel Ziv, the altar of Kelm, says a person who has mastered peace of mind has gained everything. Right? And the Jewish sources use several terms to describe, uh, you know, uh, undisturbed equanimity. And the most descriptive term to, uh, the, the most descriptive word to describe what equanimity is, is menucha tenefesh, or, or calmness of the soul. Okay, now the calm soul is a soul that it rides on a very even keel, regardless of what's happening around them, right? If you think about like surfing for a minute, right? So the surfer is rides the wave as it crests and stays upright, balanced, okay? Um, moving in a direction that you wanna go through, okay? That idea of having everything kind of come up and riding, stay, staying in that place, that level of balance Okay, is what Menucha Tenefesh is all about, right? But before you go ahead and uh, surf off into a uh, the peaceful and beguiling uh, sea, right? I want to bring up one of one, something that you know I think is important to, to uh, review as we're speaking about um, Menucha Tenefesh, and that's what, what Rabbi Stroh Salanter says over here, and he says that let's just skip down to the fourth source. As long as one lives a life of calmness and tranquility in the service of God, it is clear that he is remote from true service. Well, what does that mean? Let's go back for a second. Look at number two. This is Tehillim. David Melech says, right? He says, uh, uh, David, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. In lush meadows, he lays me down. Beside tranquil waters, he leads me. Right? This is what we're talking about. Menuchat HaNefesh, Cheshbon HaNefesh. As long as man's mind is settled, his intellectual spirit quietly stands guard, spreading its light upon the mind as if it were a torch atop the edifice of his body. Right here, we're, we're, we're being cautioned that calmness and tranquility are contrary on some level to spiritual service. Okay, that the sentiment, uh, and, and, and the sentiment is, is very clearly echoed by Rabbi Steinsaltz in his 13 petaled rose. And this is what he says He says, the Jewish approach to life considers the man who has stopped going, he who has a feeling of completion, of peace, of a great light from above that has brought him to rest to be someone who has lost his way. Only he whom the light continues to beckon, from whom the light is as distant as ever, only he can, is considered to have been received some sort of response, right? What's he saying over here? This is teaching us that the Jewish journey isn't supposed to lead you to a station called peace and, tra and tranquility. This was the mistake of our patriarch, Yaakov Abinu, who says, Yaakov 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 the idea that you know, we're aiming towards this goal of achieving this level of serenity and clarity, uh, peace of mind, right? Where uh, you're sitting in a, some wooden cabin beside a river, and you know, it's a nice idea, but not a Jewish ideal, oh. right? Really? Yeah. So now we're talking about, it's very seductive to think about, you know, um, this is escaping the storm of life and the turmoil, turmoil of life, right? To uh, find comfort, right? Sweet and soft. It's the idea of, you know, snuggling and, uh, you know, drifting to sleep and being so, so, you know, uh, I guess at rest. But is that a spiritual goal, right? Imagine you're on a ladder, right? Would you want to fall asleep? No. Yet shalom, peace, is one of the highest Jewish values. And manucha, calmness of, of rest, is the essence of Shabbat. So then, well, what does tranquility mean? What are we aiming for here? The fact that we can have both, 
The fact that we can get our, 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 ourselves to a place of equanimity, right? That doesn't spell the end of our troubles or struggles, but rather we're looking for the inner quality that equips us to handle them. When we're talking about Manucha Tanefesh, we're talking about the power, the behavior, the ability to overcome the turbulence, the, the, uh, the unsettling uh, challenges that we find in our lives. That's what real Manucha Tanefesh is, right? Difficult situations, they come up all the time. I can't escape them. Um, it's not accidental that life is made up of spiritual trials of the soul, right? Nisyonot in Hebrew, right? That are, that are often challenged and we find ourselves challenged, you know, challenge our, our midot are challenged, our, our traits are challenged, you know, especially in places where we find ourselves vulnerable in. Not an accident that we're finding ourselves in places of all kinds of circumstances that are, that, are, that are literally pushing us to become bigger, better, greater individuals. Right? Let's say, um, you know, you're, 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 if you're a person who's prone to anger, and someone steps on your toe, literally or even figuratively, right? Or you're sorely tempted to steal and someone leaves an open purse right there under your nose, you have a spiritual test. And the question is, how are you gonna respond, right? So what's the deal, right? The, the challenge is to rise to the test, to, to pass with flying colors. Okay, that is what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. That, this means that stretching into the midah, the soul trait, in a way that is both difficult for you to achieve and also good for the soul. That is what we're looking for. Now, that means there has to be a potential in every scenario that you find yourself in where you can go either way, right? There is no perfection. The, the word utopia, right, which is we all want to live in a utopian world, but in the Greek, the word utopia comes from two words, uto utopia, a city that can never be, right? It's, it's, it's something that we're, uh, we're unable, it's something we're unable to express. It's an ideal that we're trying to pursue, but not something we're able to actually express, yeah. It's a vision. It's a vision. It's an ideal, but not, necess not, 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 not something that we're actually able, we're ever able to fully possess, right? When we think about the tests along the curriculum for growth, negative challenges likely come to mind, um, lust, greed, rage, arrogance, but there are positive challenges as well. Like for example, can sometimes, you know, sometimes um, a positive challenge can be more challenging than a, uh, a negative one. So, right, so arrogance, right, greed feed on success. Oh. Right, even more effectively than on failure. Bad. Right, could be very, very bad. So, so life keeps delivering tests to our doorstep, whether we're, we happen to live, through, you know, whether we're living through them, uh, you know, days of darkness, or whether things are going well. It doesn't really matter. We got to do ourselves a favor by embracing all the struggles that we find ourselves dealing with because they are inevitable. They're woven into the plan of life. In fact. If we're committed to our own growth, we won't ever really want our struggles to come to an end. Because we see the struggle as the necessary weights to developing and growing and becoming something much more profound, right? And that's what it says, look at, look at Proverbs 17.3, the ref refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but God tests Hearts. Okay, what do you think Shlomo Melech is? What's, What's that? It's how you make silver and how you, you, take, you take the metal and you put it into a pot, into a, the way you basically melt the, the, uh, the metal. Right. But the way in which you do gold is different than silver, right? You need a much high, hotter temperature to melt down uh, gold than silver. Gold, silver is much more reactive. You need the less, you don't need, a, you don't need the same temperature to get silver to, to, to melt. But if you're trying to go ahead and make gold gold, you have to do it in a furnace, okay? But God tests hearts. What, he, what do you think he's saying over there? What is King Solomon trying to give over in this cryptic verse in Proverbs? I think what he's trying to say over here is that, that God created a heart of flesh and blood. 
But just like we mold silver and gold through furnaces and fire, the way in which we, are, we mold our heart, the way in which we find ourselves being tested and challenged in life is through overcoming the struggles of the world around us. Right? So here's a scenario. Um, one night, the Moss family uh, came home very late from a wedding. Everyone was exhausted. Uh, when they got into their, the front of the door, dad couldn't find the key, right? They all started to search. Like they looked in the car, they went to the sidewalk, but after a few, min a few minutes, everyone came up empty handed. The baby started to cry and everyone was freezing in that winter night, right? What do you think are the best rational steps that the family should take to, um, to solve this particular situation. What, 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 should, what, what, what does one do, right? Envision what would happen if the family began to panic. Get back in the car and wait. Envision, but it's cold, envision, you can't start the car. Still, it's freezing oh, outside. Yeah, the yeah and then they're looking for the key, they can't find the key. Oh, in the car? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the house. Envision what would happen if the family acted with order and calm, right? Yes. People start to panic. Right? It doesn't make the situation better. But if everyone is responding in a, uh, a place of e tranquility and equanimity, uh, that's a very different type of a uh, scenario. So when you see struggle as not only as inevitable, but as struggle as a spiritual practice, right? that is when you're being true to uh, the, uh, this concept of Musar, right? that this idea of of, of using the situation you're in as a, a form of growth and development, okay? It's really about tranquility, it's about your inner attitude to the world that you sur you're surrounded by, right? As you adopt this concept of inner equanimity and you adopt uh, your challenges as um, exercise, as weights to help build the spiritual character and uh, muscle, this is where this, this concept of balance plays itself out in the most beautiful way, right? Um, there is a, uh, in a letter to his son, Nachmanides writes that you gotta distance yourself from anger, yeah. right? Right, and Orcha Tzadikim, right? Uh, he says very, very beautifully that you have to distance yourself from pride, right? Yeah. Distance yourself from pride. Distance yourself from uh, all these negative traits. Right? But we're, ultimately, what we really want is for you to kind of grow into something more. Look at look what Kitve Ha'ari says in the Gates of Holiness. He says, my son, may God bless you, for your intentions are good. Right? Tell me though, whether or not you have attained equanimity. The rabbi said to him, Master, please explain your words. The master replied, if there were two people, and one of them honored you, right? Two people, and one of them honored you, and the other insulted you, are they equal in your eyes? And the rabbi said, no, my master, for I feel pleasure and satisfaction from the one who honors me and pain from the, the insult of the other. But I do not take revenge or bear a grudge. The master blessed the rabbi and sent him away. Go in peace, my son. When you have attained equanimity, your soul does not feel the honor der deriving from one who honors you, nor the embarrassment arising from the insults. The your, the, your consciousness is not yet ready to be attached to the supernal. Right? Meaning what we're ultimately looking for is the power, the ability of finding tranquility in our lives. Right? It doesn't matter if I'm insulted or if I'm praised. It doesn't matter if uh, someone says something to me that's mean-spirited or uh, gross and disgusting. Yeah, because the calm-spirited person doesn't really care. That person lives with God and recognizes that there's, there's din the cheshbon, that there's balance in the world. That, that, that I'm, not, I'm not someone who's going to be impacted by the words of other people. That I'm much more than that. That I'm, I'm someone who is who's able to rise above uh, these uh, negative feelings. And, 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 and someone and, says something hurtful and bad, that hurts the person. You can't do that. And not feel anything. You can, you can distance yourself from the Yes, I think that's true for most people. But again, if you see life as a spiritual opportunity of growth and development, then you recognize that every single challenge you find yourself in has been directed by the Almighty. And therefore you're being tested. How are you going to respond? The story I often tell is the story of Ramosha Feinstein, who was going to a wedding, 
And, and this is a very high level. I'm not saying it's a level that you and I could all live in. But uh, there was a young man who was very excited to give the rabbi a ride. And, uh, you know, got out of the driver's seat, went to the back and helped the rabbi get in the car. And unfortunately slammed the door on the rabbi's finger. Right? And the rabbi sat in the car and did not say a word. Not an ouch. Not a scream. It's a 40 minute drive from wherever he was to the wedding. And left it there. Right? And then when he got out of the car, he came over to another student and said, listen, you know, I, I had uh, my, my finger stuck in the door. Can you find someone here? Would you take a look at it? I want to make sure it's okay. So they said to the rabbi, why didn't you say anything? He said, well, I didn't want to embarrass him. The, the, the driver embarrassing someone is tantamount to killing them. I'd much rather... What is that? What? I, no. Embarrassing someone is tantamount to killing them. And therefore, I would much rather deal with the pain than suffer the consequences of inadvertently embarrassing someone for doing something that they didn't want to do. Now, I find the story to be interesting for several reasons. Yeah. One is, how do you get yourself to a place where when you're, when you're experiencing some sort of pain that you don't automatically gut react and have an automatic response of, ouch, that hurt. You stub your toe in the morning, it happens, all kinds of things, flies, flies out of my mouth. How do, you, how do you not say something? But when your whole life has been focused on inner tranquility, right? Of being in control of your response, right? When your whole life has been one of recognition, recognizing that every moment, of life, every moment of life is a test. And you take other people's feelings seriously. You could understand why the rabbi didn't say a word. He trained himself not to have automatic responses. He trained himself to be someone who was con in control cerebrally, where his emotion, gut reaction was not the right response. But instead, his uh, cerebral thinking through the situation he found himself in was more, more aligned with his inner work as a human being. That's what Menucha Demet Nefesh means. It does not mean V'yakov Bikesh Lesha Veshalva and Yaakov wanted to live in a tranquil state. And we know what happened afterwards. Torah says that right after that, Ve'yeshev Yaakov, what happens? Yosef is sold. And now for the next 22 years of his life, he's living in a world with, where it switches tipsy-turvy, right? No tranquility. That is not what life is about. We never get to a place of, of complete inner peace in the way in which you envision. Inner peace has to do with how in control you are of the situations that you find yourself in. That is real inner peace. Menuchat HaNefesh is about the response to the stimuli around you. Jewish vision of tranquility in Menuchat HaNefesh is not living in a world without struggle. That, my friends, is what we call comatose. That, my friends, is what we call the uh, zombie apocalypse, where people live in a life of apathy, where they don't care anymore, where they don't want to struggle, they don't want to try anymore. But to be, to be alive means to overcome. It means to uh, persevere. It means to have a vision of refining the soul. It's a lifelong journey. It doesn't happen immediately. This is what we're trying, what we're trying to stay, uh, strive for. Okay? But we're talking about you know, getting yourselves to a place where you find balance. We see this idea mentioned in the second Mishnah, Perkei Avot, where uh, Rabbi Meir says, Ezehi derech yashara adam. What is the straight path a man should take? And he says, Kol shihi tiferet la'oseha v'tiferet min, min kol adam. Everything that is tiferet that you're involved in and anything that is tiferet that will be perceived by the people around you. What does the word tiferet mean? So tiferet is often translated as uh, splendor. But that doesn't really give me an understanding of what the word means. Oh, it's harmony and balance. So very good, Hannah. Welcome back. Or, or if you're from the Ukraine, then hope you're doing well. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Welcome back. <laughs> good to see yesterday. you. Good to, good to see you. Welcome back. Hannah was uh, volunteering in Ukraine. Um, and uh, she, she was... Uh, um, she okay? she's, she's here. She's back. So she made it. She did her, she did her, her chesed. How are you come later? All right. Awesome. How long was she? She was there for like like three weeks or four weeks. How long were no, you there for? Not that long. Not that long. Feels like it was a month, but anyway. I recharged. All the way back. I recharged. Oh, okay, good. So, um, so um, in a nutshell, um, the idea of tiferet is really harmony, right? That, that the idea of tiferet, I mean, tiferet lo said tiferet adam is 
How do we bring harmony into our lives? That's really what we want. And the way in which we bring harmony into our lives is by working on this concept of Menucha Tenefesh. But don't be distracted by, the, by what I call Western ideas of Menucha Tenefesh. Western ideas of Menucha Tenefesh is, you know, at the end of the movie, the, uh, the hero rides off into the sunset and, you know, he's living for the rest of his life on a farm in a, you know, this ideal state and there's nothing bothers him and he's alone and he's living in this Zen reality. That's not the Jewish concept of Menucha Tenefesh. Menuchan, that's, 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 that, that, that idea is really an expression of, of death on some level. Of what? Death. Death is when you're flatlined, right? To be alive means a constant up and down. It's constant up and down, a heartbeat. It's constant up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. To be alive means to overcome a struggle. So Menuchan Nefesh is just a response to the stimuli you find yourself in. Now, meditation is one practice that definitely can help foster, foster, oh, we're always in that state. No, but the ones who like, like the people who are Muslim, people, people, people who are, people who are, um, people who are practitioners of Menucha Tenefesh right. are people who are able to respond to the situation they find themselves in. Remember, Judaism does not believe that the way in which you express um, greatness is by going off to an ashram in somewhere in the Himalayas and taking a vow of silence and removing yourself from society. That is not Judaism. That's not a Jewish ideal. We don't see that as spirituality. Then. The as a matter of fact, they, that's they their, that's their, their, they see, they, that they see they the trust. materialism as a evil uh, aspect, feature of this world. And we don't, we, Buddhist, yeah, I mean, not only Buddhists, but lots of other faith-based religions uh, often see the material world as a form of, uh, yeah. Uh, negative uh, attachments to physical things, something that sullies the soul. Um, aestheticism, they want to remove themselves of all physical things. We, as Jews, reject that. We say that, no, that the material world is also an expression of godliness. Oh. And therefore, uh, our job is to engage in the physical world, but elevate it to something much more profound. So I can enjoy a nice cup of coffee or a fruit, whatever it is, but I make a bracha, I make a blessing on it. I want to elevate it. I can have a beautiful suit that I wear you know, from uh, one of these fancy places on 5th, but I'm using it for Shabbat, or I'm using it for something that is more meaningful. I could drive a nice car, but I'm using it for chesed. I'm using <coughs> the physical world around me as a way of elevating the world into something much more profound. That is how we see the physical world. There's a story that was told by Rabbi Lawrence Kelman, who I've shared before as well. He's one of my rabbis. He, was, uh, he had a, I had a Shabbat table. He had two interesting guests together at the same time. Two interesting guests. Two interesting. One of them was a Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. She was a twin, mm -hmm. uh, and she was experimented on by Mengla. Her sister did not survive. She survived. They made a movie um, that, a documentary. Could be, I don't know if they did, but yes. uh, they, uh, she survived when, they, when, the, uh, when the Americans found her at the end of the war. They asked her, they asked her where, she wanted, where she wanted to die, right? Where she wanted to die. And um, she, uh, she, wanted to, she, she decided that she wanted to go to Israel. And um, when they got to Israel, the doctors there basically put her back together. She was unable to have children. At this point in her life, she was, uh, her husband had passed away. And she was this older woman who was, you know, who was the rabbi was hosting for Shabbat. At the same table was another guy. It was a younger guy who was from California, who had uh, visited this ashram and took a, a, a vow of silence, and took a vow of silence for 10 years, and not say a word for 10 years. And um, he, uh, they're at the table, and this, this guy is talking about his experience in this ashram, who was, now he became more observant, and it was a ballet teshuvah, and found Judaism, but speaking about the ashram in this very nice, beautiful, spiritual, poetic kind of way. And as he's talking about it, the Holocaust survivor keeps whispering, the ashram was evil and the Holocaust was good. Now, oh. when the, the ho, it's very hard to argue with a Holocaust survivor, you oh. know, but like, you want to be rude. So the first time she said it, he ignored her. What? The first time he said it, he ignored her. And the second time he, she said it, he ignored her again. The third time he, he couldn't hold himself back. He's like, how could you say that? How could you say that the Holocaust was good and that the ashram was bad? Like what was bad about the ashram? And I think this, this is a very important point that I want to make for you guys today. This is what she said, and I think there's a tremendous amount of depth and wisdom to this. She said that when the Holocaust had just started, 
and everyone knew what was happening at this point because this was towards the end of the war when they got her. She's like, you know, I memorized the book of Esther and every single day I would recite the book of Esther. And my friend memorized the book of Psalms and every day she recited the book of Psalms. And my other friend memorized, everyone took on things. And they saw the Holocaust as a unique opportunity to preserve and build themselves as individuals. She said, but you selfishly sat for 10 years in silence. What did you do for the world? You just took space and gave nothing back? She's like, that is evil. And it's a very, uh, only a Holocaust survivor could say that, say it like that, yeah. right? It's a chutzpah, right? The whole purpose of life is to give back to humanity. And we did that. We found ourselves in hor horrible places. I was experimented on, she said. But I still saw the space that I was in as a place where I could give back. Viktor Frankl speaks about this in Man's Search for Meaning. How the people who had a very clear purpose and, and uh, vision of who they wanted to service and care for, who they were waiting for someone, they were able to overcome the most, ha the most difficult situations they found themselves in. But the second a survivor in the camp found out that a loved one or someone else that they were trying to wait for was gone, within 24 hours they died. They shriveled up, they left. Yes. There's nothing there anymore. Right. So meaning is a very important part of our mission as human beings, to find meaning in our lives. But the way in which we respond is so important. I'm not saying that Menuchat HaNefesh means, you know, uh, being in a, this a numb state where you don't respond to the situation you're in. The opposite. I'm saying that just like the surfer who's riding that wave, he has to know where he's going. He has to know how he's going to respond to the situation he's in. That is Menuchat HaNefesh. The definition of Menuchat HaNefesh is understanding how to respond in the circumstance that you find yourself in. I have a question, though. Yeah. This, this is like, okay, so I'm hearing like different, not extremes, but like ways that people deal or don't deal, right? Like there's yeah. a emotional fighting story, yeah. and there's this story of these two people. Yeah. But... But even like, okay, let I, for me, <clears throat> like I go to classes, I, you know, I count the Omer, I work on myself. Yeah. Still, there is definitely a desire to like leave the city and go to the mountains and all that. And I don't mean just for like a weekend. <laughs> and I have some friends to have done that, you right. know, and so where, how, I think there is some emet to the challenge of trying to remain tranquil in an environment that is extremely chaotic, painful, harsh, you know? It's not just about, okay, are you working on yourself? Right, listen, I, I get, the point that I'm making is that, um, of course, there are times where you need to go out and like go, go away and like take a break and go on vacation and everyone, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying you can't take a break, but the question is, why are you taking the break? Mm -hmm. If taking the break is a form of escapism, yeah. that's a problem. If the purpose of the break is for you to kind of refresh, to get back in the game, yeah. that's something very different. I think, I think Rabbi Steinzel says it the best. He says, when he describes a Jewish spiritual experience, he describes it as the constant beckoning towards light. Yes. I love that. The constant beckoning towards light. Yes. And the key word in that phrase is constant. Yes. Are you... Like I said earlier, do you see yourself on a ladder that is constantly growing? That's all I care about. What you look like is none of my business. I don't care what you look like. I care that you see yourself on a journey that is helping you achieve something more. As long as you're growing, there's constant growth in your life, that's what matters most to me. That's what should matter most to you. The word constant, okay, you take that word seriously, then with the light that we seek is presented at all times and all situations, even if there are murky or dark days that, that come up in our way, I'm constant, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that you will always find yourself doing what is right. But if we just see things as kind of like, you know, one struggle after the other, and it's, it's just, oh, again? It's so annoying, it's so this, and that, and that's your attitude. You're just setting yourself up for a life of misery. 
And the Torah doesn't want you to live a life of misery. We want you to live a life of happiness, of simcha. We want you to live a life of inner, of inner light, of inner growth. And therefore, the more we try to describe, you know, um, this concept of anuchad of nefesh, right? I, I, I would say the less accurate the description is, <laughs> right? Because it's such a hard thing to like wrap our heads around, and I, I'm, I've struggled to like to express this in a way that's meaningful. It's almost like the nefesh of the person who has manucha of nefesh is extremely active. Correct, but if you're using the word manucha, which is like a weird word to use, the, 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 the rested soul is really the active soul who's working on bringing balance into his life, but, but through engaging the world, yeah. right? So we, we, even calling it light is a metaphor, right? It's, it's, we're talking about something that is very difficult to classify, right? But there's no question that if you're someone who is, um, who's able to tune into the inner light that is present in all things and all beings, meaning you recognize that everything around you is being directed by the Almighty, that you, your life, your circumstances are really an expression of what we call the Ratzon Hashem, the will of God on some level. We have choices as human beings, but ultimately, why am I here? Why are we here? You know, why are we doing this? Not an accident, right? We need to hear this lesson together today. Once you're able to do that, and you realize what you're looking for is not just physical light, but something much more subtle, right? The ability uh, to pick out an object that is right near you, right? And, and, and ask yourself the question, can I see the inner light in this? Can I see the inner light in the situation that I'm in? I mean, I'm able to see the brilliant presence behind the uh, every single face and facet of the things that are around me, right? That is how we're able to kind of change the way we deal with the situations that we find ourselves in, right? If you're able to uh, strengthen yourself in this concept of menucha when we are, when we respond to the ever-changing circumstances of our lives, right? You'll find yourself living in a different reality. You'll find yourself having the power of, you'll find yourself having power, A. Eh? You won't feel yourself depleted and, and, and negative and, and empty. You'll find yourself living in a world of inspiration and meaning again. This is how you breathe meaning back into your lives, okay? So, I would tell you that the thing that you want to do the most to bring in Menuchat HaNefesh is to be mindful that every single moment of life is a gift. And we say this, we say this in the Mishnah. Gemara says that that one moment of life in this world is greater than all of Olam Haba. Why? Because this is the only reality where we're challenged. This is the only reality where challenge equals growth. Why did God create the world? To give you pleasure. He created the world to give you the power of choosing to want to be something much more profound. The word for animal in Hebrew is behemah. And Maharal says the word behemah comes from the words ba ma. What you see is what you get. An animal does not change. It's stuck in a flat-lined position. The Zora says that every single creature in the world lives on a horizontal plane. And what makes human beings so unique is that we live on a vertical plane. And the reason why that vertical plane is so unique is because we have a power of literally stretching out and being more than ourselves. Okay, the only difference, the only other creature in the world that lives on a, ver on a vertical plane, aside from human beings, are plants. Plants, trees. Oh. No. All animals. They're vertebrate, they're all of them. Monkeys, giraffes, penguins, uh, kangaroos, those are the ones I always get pushed back on. But yeah, if you study, cl study closer, who they are. They all live on that horizontal plane. Kangaroos? Kangaroos, yeah, I did that already, yeah. Even kangaroos, they all live on a horizontal penguins. plane. Even penguins, right? Penguins, you will classify them as a bird or a fish. They live on a horizontal plane. It's true, they stand up that way, but it doesn't mean that that's their reality because ultimately what we're describing is a, a creature that is stuck in a world. An animal cannot get outside of itself. They waddle around like that. But when they're actually looking for food and whatnot, they're in a horizontal state, okay? When they're active, they're in a horizontal right. state. Kangaroos, when they're active, they're in a horizontal state, okay? Uh, human beings, in a vertical state. Ready? I'll end with the following idea. How tall does a tree grow? <coughs> a tree grows as tall as it, 
as tall as it can. As tall as it can. As, as much as it can. A tree will grow as much as it can. And whenever it reaches its end, it'll end. How, how tall does a human being grow? I'm not talking about his height. I'm talking about, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about his height. I'm talking about his inner growth. How that depends on the individual. Right? This is, this is different from every other creature on planet Earth. Right? A dog is a dog. It'll be the best dog it can be. A lion is a lion. It can't be anything more than a lion. A cow who's grazing on the side of the mountain will not stop and say, you know what, I've got to slow down. I'm eating too much grass. I've got to lose some weight. I'm going on a jog today. It doesn't happen. But a human being has a power of choice, and therefore our greatness, our height, our spiritual heights, depend on us. How we respond to the situation that we find ourselves in, our growth is very much tethered to our manucha tanefesh. If we live with manucha tanefesh, I guarantee that you'll find yourselves living a life of greater spiritual happiness, greater spiritual growth. And more importantly, you won't see the world around you anymore as negative, You'll see yourself in a situation that is uniquely designed to give you the ability to achieve your unique bliss, your unique mission in this world. May you so be blessed. So that you walk in that bliss, finally? We, we don't believe that bliss exists in this world. Uh-huh. We believe that, this, that, that, that bliss doesn't even, doesn't even happen when you die. Uh-huh. That that bliss only happens in Olam Haba. Olam Haba is a state where the body and the soul are reconnected through something called the resurrection of the dead. And at some point, that even process of body and soul reunification ends, okay? And there is a new type of, I will we'll call it death or rebirth, of the body and soul leaving this reality into a whole other reality, which is very hard to explain because I don't understand it myself. But anyway, no, 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 that's the wrong religion. Anyway, I want to wish you all a, uh, an amazing week. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you with the clarity and the recognition that every single moment you find yourself in is an opportunity to respond to greatness. Thanks for listening.